like to say a couple of words about uh, the differences in enforcement between the United States and the European Union. In, uh, um, in the, um, uh, François Lebay said that earlier this morning about that, uh, talking about the better protection regulation, uh, that we want to enforce, uh, to reinforce the better protection authorities with more human and financial resources, give them the power to impose dissuasive fines. Mark Bernberg said, referring to the White House uh, Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights, that its principle should come with enforcement. And um, it seems, therefore, that enforcement is uh, one of the key issues of, um, of the transatlantic uh, privacy debate. But how can it be achieved? The EU, the EU system is based on general data protection principles and different levels of enforcement, from statutory supervision to administrative, civil, and criminal sanctions, but also through self-regulation and co-regulation. Enforcement relies mostly on rules that government authorities, that are protection authorities, apply and enforce in their respective member states. In the United States, enforcement of internet users' privacy rights is made mostly through sectoral laws, privacy policies, and self-regulatory mechanisms, either at the state level or federal level, but also through vigorous advocacy and class action lawsuits. It's difficult to compare the effectiveness of enforcement between the US on the one hand and the EU on the other and come to a conclusion about whether um, one or the other enforcement system is more effective than the other as they're done through different legal mechanisms, pursuant to different legal concepts and through different private, governmental, or public interest authorities or organizations. Speakers may want to try to answer that question, compare the effectiveness of enforcement. So, uh, the speakers will also share their experiences from various angles. Um, the consultative authority through the, the Article 29 Working Party, the enforcement authorities, the European Commission, the Federal Trade Commission and Data Protection Authorities, government agencies, the Department of Commerce, and non-profit organizations and advocacy groups. The other issue that will be raised in this panel is whether enforcement can develop concurrently in the European Union and the United States with the same level of commitment and effectiveness, and how. We we'll hear speakers talk about whether and how it's possible to improve privacy enforcement cooperation at the transatlantic level. After hearing from all speakers, we'll hear from someone who's been trying since last year as a social network user and data subject to get his right of access and deletion actually enforced. The right to inquire about the profile of the company, social networking company, has been building about him. And the right to delete all of the data in that profile. He will ask panelists questions directly related to his experience. We start with um, Mr. Cameron Carey, uh, who's general counsel with the US Department of Commerce. Mr. Kerry. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Dahl. Uh, uh, let me say at the outset that enforcement is an area where uh, privacy protection is strong in the United States uh, uh, and multi layer. Uh, the Obama administration strongly supports uh, uh, consistent uh, and reinforced protection of uh, enforcement of laws to protect privacy of individual rights. Uh, as you heard uh, a little while ago from Julie Brill, uh, you'll hear more from Anisha, uh, the Federal Trade Commission is a global leader uh, in enforcing privacy protections. Uh, but the FTC is not alone. Uh, the US uh, sectoral approach uh, uh, brings uh, uh, the resources of different federal and state agencies. Uh, the Grand Leash Lightly Act is enforced by the Consumer uh, uh, the Consumer Financial Protection Board as well as by the FTC. HIPAA is enforced by the Department of Health and Human Services. State Attorneys General enforce uh, uh, data breach privacy uh, notification laws and other state privacy laws. And the, uh, you know, the, the web uh, of these laws, uh, uh, you know, uh, even though it's not comprehensive, set standards uh, uh, across the board. Uh, and 
this array of enforcement entities in the United States works to protect uh, U.S. citizens, uh, but not only U.S. citizens, uh, as we've seen with the uh, the FTC's safe harbor settlements uh, uh, and enforcement of the safe harbor framework. Enforcement is something that is emphasized in the White House uh, privacy blueprint uh, while recognizing the good work that is going on today by these agencies, by this uh, uh, system of enforcement. Uh, we are asking to give additional authority to the FTC uh, to strengthen enforcement, additional authority to state attorneys general. So what we are seeking to have Congress do is uh, to establish the Consumer Bill of Rights uh, as a baseline uh, to give the FTC the authority to enforce that directly, to give state attorneys general the authority to enforce uh, that directly, uh, and to expand uh, enforcement cooperation. Applying the Bill of Rights to particular industries and circumstances uh, uh, above this baseline, uh, and regardless of when Congress uh, acts, is something uh, that we would be done through the multi-stakeholder processes, uh, which would benefit uh, to win-win uh, for consumers uh, and for businesses. Uh, these enforceable codes will provide uh, clear guidance to uh, both consumers and to businesses as to what uh, they can expect uh, in, a different, in a particular situation. Uh, the administration is not going to wait uh, for legislation. As you heard from Larry Strickland this morning, uh, the Commerce Department is moving ahead to, to convene stakeholders to uh, develop consensus codes of conduct. And these codes of conduct will be legally enforced. This is not uh, merely self-regulation, but it is uh, bringing the tools of regulation that exist under uh, to hold uh, companies to their promises uh, to the development of stakeholder codes of conduct. And this brings me to uh, an important impact of this strong U.S. enforcement. Uh, in the United States, if a company makes a promise, uh, it makes a promise to follow a code of conduct, it makes a promise to follow a privacy policy, uh, it is held accountable for that promise uh, uh, under the federal and state uh, uh, deceptive practice authority uh, under Section 5 of the FTC Act and, and its equivalents. Um, in the EU, there's no corollary uh, uh, restriction on companies' private commitments uh, absent a violation of specific uh, law. Uh, so I'm encouraged to see the uh, focus on accountability, including uh, binding corporate rules. Uh, uh, these may uh, open the door to greater recognition of codes of conduct uh, as part of uh, the, uh, the system of privacy protection uh, and help to further uh, cross-border interoperability. You know, Alexis uh, de Tocqueville observed that one of the unique things about the American system is the ways uh, that lawyers are involved uh, and that, you know, a great many things uh, end up as a judicial question. Uh, this is, uh, at least as true, uh, two centuries uh, later. Um, and the tenet of U.S. law that promises have consequences means that companies pay attention to compliance. They have staffs of general counsels and compliance officers uh, who watch out for legal risk. They take this culture of compliance with them when they go overseas. They pay attention to their legal obligations, uh, uh, even if enforcement is inconsistent uh, or non-existent uh, in countries where they operate. So to conclude, let me uh, say that this administration takes uh, enforcement very seriously. I'm pleased that this topic is getting attention today and look forward to your questions uh, and to working uh, with the EU to provide uh, clear uh, consistent guidance and enforcement in the future. Thank you very much, Mr. Kerry. And now we hear from the European side, Mr. Mm -hmm. Paul Nemitz, who's the director of um, the Department of Fundamental Rights and Citizenship of the Director General of Justice of the European Commission. 
Thank you, Chair. I think it's important to realize that enforcement is not a goal on its own. But in the end, what we're all aiming for together is compliance. And compliance is something which can be achieved in many ways. Enforcement is only part of these ways. The second uh, thing I would like to say as a point of principle from the start is that um, the basis of our discussion between the United States and Europe as to the importance of compliance and therefore also enforcement is very different. As we have just heard from Cameron Perry, the American principle is promises by companies have consequences. That's good. And that's a principle which you also find in Europe in unfair trade and consumer law. But in Europe, beyond that, not only the company which makes a promise must comply with data protection rules. In Europe, data, the right to protection is the fundamental principle of the treaties, of the Fundamental Rights Charter, and in fact of the constitutional provision of many of our member states. And that explains uh, a lot. That explains why in Europe we have a system of protection laws and a system of enforcement covering all sectors and all companies independent of whether they are accepting these rights. Our citizens expect, because the constitutional promise has been made to them, that these rights are enforced and that they are protected. Now, how does this work in practice? In the treaty and in the Charter of Fundamental Rights, it is very clearly laid out, and this is unique, that uh, protection of privacy is um, it has to be secured inter alia by independent uh, authorities. In each member state we have at least one uh, of those uh, independent authorities which together have around 1,500 uh, officials uh, in the European Union. Now, these authorities have very broad case history. Is it fair to say that the FTC is a global leader in enforcement? I would uh, hesitate uh, to undersign that. I would say uh, some of the activities of the FTC are certainly uh, global leaders in the, the PR. Um, uh, but uh, if you look at the activities of the German, of the Spanish, of the French data protection authorities, maybe also because of language barriers, they concern sometimes the similar companies, address very important issues, and have a similar impact uh, like, like the FTC. Um, so, I think uh, uh, the importance of enforcement and the effectiveness of enforcement in Europe, I think it is beyond doubt, but the English language visibility uh, of this enforcement is maybe not as big as that of the authority which is placed in Washington and which is also active in other important areas of enforcement such as antitrust law. Which brings me also to um, a basic principle in our debate. I think it is important that privacy law learns from the enforcement experience in other areas of law. The enforcement issues we are, not, we are facing in privacy are not different from enforcement issues we are facing in other areas of law, such as um, uh, antitrust, for example. And I think there it is right to say that the FTC is uniquely placed uh, to bring in this experience because it brings this uh, experience together a little bit, uh, let's say, in an asymmetric way. Also, the Commission brings this uh, experience together. We are not in the European Commission an enforcement authority for privacy, but we are an enforcement authority uh, on antitrust, and this is certainly something which can inform our debate in the future, too. What is new in the regulation we are proposing on enforcement? First, we want to equip our authorities with similar tools, uh, more effective tools, uh, also more uh, effective sanctions, and indeed, the methodology of sanctions in terms of percentages related to turnover, uh, this is a methodology which comes uh, from competition law. Second, one-stop shop, one law. This was mentioned already before. We believe this is a facilitation uh, for companies, but at the same time, will also increase the coherence and legal certainty uh, when it comes to enforcement. Um, finally, uh, on uh, international uh, cooperation, yes, we need, um, again, to learn from 
uh, the enforcement history and the history of cooperation in other areas. Uh, also on the international enforcement, privacy is not so special and so not so unique that the actions and the experience we have taken together in other areas could not be uh, transposed to this area. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Nimitz. Uh, we don't hear the uh, Federal Trade Commission's perspective. Uh, <laughs> and I invite you to hear uh, Anisha Vidal, uh, the Associate Director of the Division of Privacy and Identity Protection. Thank you. Uh, I do want to address Paul's comments um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, in my presentation. Um, so, I think it is often said the U.S. has a sector-based approach, uh, and we certainly do. We have, as Ken mentioned, the Grand Lynch Liley Act, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, HIPAA, and others. Um, but, of course, we also have the FTC Act, which prohibits unfair or deceptive practices in a broad range of sectors. Um, so, I think it's a little bit misleading to say that we only have sector-specific laws. Um, and certainly at the FTC, as you heard from Commissioner Brill, enforcement is, is really a top priority. And let me just mention five of our privacy enforcement uh, priorities. <laughs> First is social networking. Uh, you heard from Commissioner Brill our cases against uh, Facebook and Google, so I won't go into those. Second is online tracking. We have brought several cases against uh, online advertising networks that offered consumers the ability to opt out of online tracking. Those opt-outs did not work as consumers expected, and we allege that those practices were deceptive under the FTC Act. Uh, another case involving online tracking that I think is interesting is our case against uh, View Promise, which is a program that partners with other merchants and so that consumers can earn points towards college savings. So View Promise had offered an online toolbar to consumers where the toolbar would highlight the partner merchants so consumers could go shop there and earn points towards their college savings. So the company told consumers that we were going to collect information about your browsing history. What the company didn't tell consumers is that they were also going to collect information from secure web pages, such as shopping carts and secure online banking sessions. Uh, and so we allege that even though that they had made a representation, they did have a privacy policy, they deceptively failed to disclose the extent of online tracking. So I think a lot of times our law is, is um, characterized as if you make a statement and it's untrue, that's the only thing that's deceptive. But I think our deception authority goes a little bit broader than that. A third priority is data security. We've brought uh, about 35 data security cases over the last several years. A fourth priority is mobile privacy. Uh, we announced our first mobile privacy case last year against a company called W3 uh, Innovations. This was a company that was selling uh, mobile apps directed towards children, and it was collecting children's information without parental consent. And then a fifth area of uh, priority is the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Uh, a lot of people think of the FCRA as a financial or credit statute, uh, but in a lot of ways it's a privacy statute. It says that uh, certain companies cannot share information about sensitive consumer report information unless the recipient has a permissible purpose. So for example, a list of consumers that, uh, that have, are late on their mortgages, um, that could be considered a, um, a consumer report, and you can't sell that for marketing purposes. Um, so, so those are our main priorities. Um, uh, you know, another um, uh, piece on the FCRA, I think a lot of times we bring enforcement actions, but we've also been sending companies warning letters. Um, so on the Fair Credit Reporting Act, um, we came across these mobile apps um, that were instant background screening apps. And the way they were marketed was, it said, uh, you, know, you meet somebody in a bar. Um, while they're in the bathroom, do an instant background check on them on your mobile app. And so, um, so we looked at these apps and we realized that if the apps could be used for those purposes, they could also be used for employment purposes, doing instant background checks on people seeking employment. And so if they were doing that, they would be covered by the Fair Credit Reporting Act. And so a lot of people don't know this, and so we've sent warning letters to these companies suggesting that if they had a reasonable basis to believe that the information was being used for employment purposes, they would be covered by the Fair Credit Reporting Act. So the final point I just want to get to is, uh, is Paul's point about having a better PR uh, than our European colleagues, perhaps. Um, I, I think, you know, I, I consider that a compliment because I think... Um, <laughs> Cases against smaller companies is that we publicize those cases 
and, and we believe our cases serve as a deterrent to other actors who are, um, who are maybe developing mobile apps or engaging in new kinds of businesses. And so, um, so we do seek to publicize our law enforcement actions to make sure to deter those type, uh, kinds of conduct so that uh, uh, companies engage in better practices in the future. So thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, now we hear from Mr. Jacob Constant, who is the chairman of the Articles of Union and Voting Party, also the chairman of the Dutch Protection uh, Authority in Europe. Thank you, Chairman, and, and let's start with, uh, with the Dutch um, uh, VR. Uh, most of our enforcement actions, we, we, we publicize them in, in, in Dutch. Um, which, which might cause um, the sort of idea that we, we don't do the things that we are supposed to do, but nevertheless, uh, most of our enforcement actions are, are pretty successful. We do a lot of work, but then I'll, I'll, I'll be talking about it uh, in, in, in the five minutes I've got. Um, but at the same time, jokes apart, this is, of course, the difficulty of the European Union for the time being, having 27 <coughs> data protection authorities uh, and, 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 and therefore perhaps um, having less PR possibilities because there's 27 uh, independent bodies who, 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 of course, within the working party tries to coordinate their, their going around with I'll, I'll, I'll get to it. I'll, I'll concentrate on two points as far as the draft regulation is concerned because I think um, there's, there's two points who, that are really important, new, and, and will, will be better equipped to, to do the enforcement uh, business. And I'll, I'll, I, I fully agree with what Paul Lemmich said that, that the name of the game is, of course, not enforcement but it's compliance. And you absolutely need enforcement um, rigorously if you, if you want uh, compliance to, uh, to uh, happen. Of course, we've been talking today on, on questions of accountability and responsibility, um, but in the end, um, enforcement is inevit inevitable. An inevitable tool to get there to get to, to compliance. And so in the new draft regulation, um, the, the, some of the paragraphs uh, introduce um, significant fines that for several reasons, I don't know exactly why, were lowered in the um, eve of Christmas and the New Year's days. The, the, the first draft that was uh, uh, you, everyone would find on, on the internet said that the fines would go up to 5% of the annual worldwide turnover. And the final um, draft now, uh, it is up to 2% of the annual worldwide turnover for, for private uh, companies, of course. Of course, um, I, I think that's, that's, that's good. And, 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 and that's a big step forward uh, in comparison to the situation right now, because some of us, some of the data protection authorities in the EU, EU do not even have a fine possibility uh, at, at this moment. Um, so I think that's a big step forward, although, of course, fines will always need to be proportionate and taken into consideration all circumstances of the specific case. But as a net result, I think the threat of high penalties may be very helpful in getting data protection an important courtroom issue and will therefore also be a key issue while inventing and making new products and services. I must admit that as far as the Dutch data protection authority is concerned, we changed our strategy a couple of years ago, not primarily investing our people in helping um, to explain how to be compliant with the Dutch data protection law, but really focused on enforcement. And until now, we have seen in the Netherlands the, the result of it, that after a couple of bigger Dutch enforcement cases, uh, we, we, we have seen a raise in attention for privacy issue 
in the commercial sphere. Now, a second point that I want to raise, how to improve the, privacy, the global privacy enforcement cooperation. The regulation, the draft regulation, proposed to introduce the concept of the so-called one-stop shop. The DPA in the member state where a company has a main establishment will become the so-called elite DPA. The primus inter pares of all DPAs confronted with the same company and the same problem. There are still important details to be resolved. For example, the definition of main establishment is not quite clear, not clear enough in any way. And the way the so-called back office, uh, the, 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 where the more DPAs have to coordinate their work is organized, is still to be discussed. But the one-stop shop and the coordination and consistency mechanism will, if done correctly, ensure infringement and non-compliance are not treated differently in just a theoretical example, Dublin or Hamburg. <laughs> now, also having one lead DPA in the EU will stimulate global privacy enforcement. The lead DPA will be the one to call, so to say, if a colleague in the US, FTC, or in Canada, or Asia Pacific region would want Europe on the line in enforcement cases. And so in conclusion, yes, we need a stick, a heavy stick, if we want CEOs to be leading their companies in a way their products and services are in compliance with data protection and privacy rights. And secondly, yes, the proposed EU coordination and consistency mechanism will promote privacy enforcement cooperation. Thank you. Uh, so then we have to explain the special connection that exists between uh, Dublin and Hamburg. Uh, we go now to Mr. Kostas Rosolu, who is a senior legal officer <coughs> with BUK, the European Consumers Organization. Well, many thanks. Uh, well, I'm a bit surprised because in all day we're talking about enforcement, public authorities, FTC, data protection authorities, <coughs> enforcing the law, uh, companies having to be compliant with the legislation, but what happens to the individuals, the data subjects, that let's say there is a breach, there is an infringement, and his data has been compromised, what happens to, to, to the data subject as such? And this public enforcement is important, is the first step, but there's also private enforcement, uh, which is a complementary tool with different objective, which is uh, private enforcement is also uh, to get compensation, and this is really important. And I would just like to start from where we are right now in Europe and provide you with a couple of concrete cases to show uh, how consumer organizations or individuals have not uh, had effective access uh, to the remedies that are already in the data protection framework and then highlight uh, the importance of the new proposals of the European Commission. Well, at least in the European Union, every individual has a right to a remedy. But in practice, this is not uh, easy to exercise. And first of all, for the very simple reason that if I want to exercise my rights, I need to be aware that my data has been, have been, has been compromised, which is not always the case. Um, at least in Europe, there is no breach notification of the data subject, not yet. Uh, companies are not very transparent about the rights they grant to the consumer. And even if the consumer becomes aware that his data has been compromised, and he tries to get redress, then the question is like, where should I go? Should I go to Dublin, although I live in Italy? And why should I go to Dublin if I'm a European resident, I'm a European consumer living in Italy, my personal data has been compromised in Italy, I should be able to go in my home country to uh, enforce my rights. And there's also uh, the question of uh, the applicable laws, the restriction and the applicable law that go together. And just to highlight, I uh, was two concrete cases. One was the Facebook. Uh, Max is the right person to talk, but just to, to let you know that uh, consumer organizations in two cases, they tried to bring action against Facebook. One was the Norwegian Consumer Council, uh, who launched a complaint with the uh, national DPA, and for them the, the main problem was the jurisdiction that pick up law. They tried to have the action in Norway, it was impossible, finally the complaint went to Ireland. And even, even more important, in Germany, the German Consumer Federation, um, they tried to uh, uh, file a complaint against Facebook in Germany, but they were not able to file it on the basis of data protection law. 
and also in order to ensure that the complaint goes with a German court, they decided to bring an action against Facebook on the basis of contract law, and actually they won this case. This also shows the problem uh, that uh, currently uh, consumer organizations face. And then the second set of examples is about the Google. And I'm sorry for uh, picking two American companies offering services to European consumers, but maybe it is a PR exercise, but these are cases that affect consumers on their everyday life. And then my question, um, I'm wondering, uh, because at least in the US side, there have been a legal settlement with Google, and Google has to implement a coherent global privacy program. And then I have two questions. One is um, the compromise by Google of the Safari privacy settings. Like, in my understanding, if I'm a company committed to having a global privacy uh, program, normally I should comply with the rules and be very careful. And the second one is a change of the privacy policy. I think we're talking about accountability and responsibility of companies, but when we see a company that decides and imposes on the consumer new privacy settings, that there's a lot of concerns, and these concerns are raised by data protection authorities in the US, the EU, Japan, Australia, platform consumer organizations from both sides of the Atlantic, and still this company decides to go ahead and just simply ignore uh, consumer protection uh, and data protection authorities. This also raises a lot of concerns. Can we rely on those companies being responsible and accountable and simply rely on them that they, they take care of our data and we should be safe? I have my doubts. And then this is why we really like uh, the proposal of the European Commission because it is personal data, protection of personal data, it is a fundamental right in Europe. And if it's a fundamental right, it needs to be properly enforced and protected. And in addition to the part on sanctions that are really, really important because uh, you need to have a deterrent factor. You need, the company needs to be, let's say, afraid that if they do not comply with the rules, they will be having sanctions. What is also important is that there, will be, there, there is also collective actions, uh, judicial actions, fully flexed collective actions, also for compensation. And I think that this is very welcome that the proposal of the European Commission introduces representative actions in order to facilitate individuals uh, with a um, low level of damages, hard quantified damages, to be represented. But what is missing, and I think this is an experience that the US can share uh, with Europe, is a collective action for compensation. And uh, it's a pity to see that, for example, there is a class action against social networks in the US, and European consumers can only join the class action in the US. They cannot uh, seek redress uh, feasibly in Europe. I believe that. Jeff Chester is the executive director of the Center for Digital Democracy. We'd love for us to give you his perspective. Thank you very much. I want to thank especially the Commission for inviting me and inviting several members of the Transatlantic Consumer Dialogue, of which Beuk is one of the, of the key uh, members for participating on the panels today. This is a critical time because the global standards to protect consumers is at stake. And which model, how will we harmonize the rules and regulations to protect consumers? Because in the last two or three years, there's been a, despite the regulations, despite the policies, there's been a dramatic expansion of data collection and user targeting across the North America, Asia Pacific, the European Union, now the Middle East, and Latin and South America. There's been a tremendous expansion of a, a form of digital data collection called social media marketing. Because although the basic model of online marketing and data collection, and which raises questions about whether you have to be worried about the innovation and flexibility, the basic model was set in the early 1990s, one-to-one -one marketing. We would collect all the information about you as an individual, wherever you go, whatever you do, and then we'll target you. That's still the dominant paradigm. But now because of social media, they're analyzing the flow of communications between you and your friends. For myself, as a US NGO, privacy advocate, I want to underscore the importance of the, of the European Union in enshrining in, in law and creating institutions to protect privacy. And indeed, I have often found, and my colleagues have often found, that we've had to take the documents generated in Europe, especially by the Article 29, to the Federal Trade Commission and say, aha, look, cookies, persistent identifiers, that's individuals today. So I want to applaud that work. Now, although the recent White House Bill of Rights is a step forward, I want to raise some concerns. It's based on a flawed mechanism for implementation. 
Ultimately, it's about blocking a handful of consumer advocates who have minimal resources. It's not a resource issue in terms of, in terms of funding, so to speak, in terms of our salary. Minimal resources with industry and hoping that the consumer and privacy advocates have the wisdom and the information you know, and the ethical standard to only agree to, to conditions that truly will protect privacy for citizens and consumers. I think, frankly, that's a fallacious notion that's never going to happen. Because if you understand the mechanism that has been created over the last 15 years, in which the US companies are the dominant ones, but now all the major ad agencies have created data buying this, many of those are US companies as well, they spread the system, you just can't pick off one tiny piece and not address uh, the other. Codes of conduct will not be uh, effective. And, and for example, the US has already kind of embraced this ICON program that if you have good eye, eyesight and you, you know, you're able to click on it, really takes you to a set of, of, of information services that don't really tell you what's going on. Now, the Federal Trade Commission. Part of the uh, Obama plan is, okay, we'll come up with these code of conducts and the FTC will in, enforce. Look, Google and Facebook, and they did a tremendous job at the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, you know, and I, and, but let's remember, this is the Obama Federal Trade Commission, and they deserve praise. One, 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 administrative, one administration's Federal Trade Commission is not the other. For the eight years under the prior administration, they were asleep at the digital switch. They allowed many of the subprime loans, which ultimately created the global crisis, originated and still originates online. The Federal Trade Commission really did not intervene. The Congress had to come back and create a whole new agency in, in, in a way as criticizing in a way what the Federal Trade Commission and other agencies uh, did uh, uh, do. The Federal Trade Commission is hobbled with lack of resources. And although they did these consent degrees for Facebook and Google, if you follow what Facebook and Google are doing, they're expanding the way they collect data all across the globe. We did not create a, a global uh, a framework. What we did was to say, you have to be honest from now on. And, and, and I think we have to hold them to it. But well, whatever remains to be seen. Now, I challenge both the EU and the United States. I think there's been a lack of enforcement about these new ways that data is being collected through these online ad auctions. As you probably all know, increasingly, we're sold to the highest bidder in real time through these autonomous mechanisms that Google and Microsoft and Yahoo and the ad agency and the ad agencies run for a big target for health information, for a political information, you know, for financial services. None of this is transparent, none of this is, none of this is disclosed. And as far as I can see, neither the FTC or the European Union have really tackled this contemporary problem that threatens our, our, our privacy. I would urge the EU to resist any negotiated new safe harbors uh, with the United States that's based on a weak combination of codes of conduct and enforcement. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. And now we come to uh, someone who's been very active last year. Uh, he's uh, an Austrian student. And uh, after receiving, um, after insisting uh, several times with, um, with the company, Facebook, uh, to get access to his data, he received a 100 page document revealing uh, about 60 different fields of the information he had um, put online. Um, he decided to, um, to bring up the case uh, against Facebook before the, the Irish Data Protection Authority after um, realizing that some of the data in those 57 fields, he'd actually deleted them and he still found them in that profile. Thank you. Um, I just heard from, especially the beginning of the panel, um, data, enforcement, uh, data protection enforcement is great and it's getting even better. That was like what I got from the first part. Um, we did the reality test for Facebook, which is like the one big corporation that is always discussed whenever it comes to privacy. And we found out that they are breaching the most basic principles of data protection. To give you an example, they, in our direct conversation, said, no, we don't get consent for a lot of the things. We just don't have it. Um, there are things that there are 40,000 people may, making access requests to Facebook. No one of them gets their data. That's really basic data. It's nothing you really got to argue about, usually. Another thing was in my data set, because I got my data, there were a bunch of deleted data that shouldn't be there anymore. Um, so we're talking about really principal things. And, um, I gotta say that if it takes a couple of students, like in our case, 
to bring the case about the Irish Data Protection Commissioner and to get something going, the only result of that is that you actually got to say that the enforcement mechanisms that you have right now and Facebook is um, enforceable under US law, under the safe harbor, as well as here, both failed because it cannot be that it takes a couple of students to do that. Um, that's the first point. So um, my question for that is, um, what does it actually need to make at least the big shops compliant with the most basic principles we actually have in the law right now? Um, big first question, especially um, to the enforcement um, um, parties right now. Another question I got um, at a lot of um, conferences I, I went to is a fair competition issue. Um, we have American, uh, German companies that point at Facebook and say, you know, we have to stick to all these tight laws in Germany, but Facebook doesn't in Ireland. Then you talk to the representatives of Facebook, they point at Google and say, hey, we are pretty good if you compare it to a new privacy policy of Google. <laughs> <laughs> then you probably walk to Google and they're going to say, hey, we're at least in the safe harbor. Other American companies are not even that. Um, so, and all of them are in the same market and um, have, are in a direct competition, which is a huge issue for these companies because German companies are dying oftentimes because they cannot just send out a bunch of, of, of invitations. The last question I have is, I, do have, I am in a lot of panels where it is like the average European show sitting in front of me. And oftentimes I get the question, if I run a stoplight, if I'm too fast, I get a penalty. Why isn't that happening with the big corporation? What's the difference and what's the justification for not enforcing the law on them while it is enforced on every average citizen? Thank you. I'll take this over here for a moment for a bit of housekeeping. Uh, can we have a sign from Brussels if there are any questions in Brussels? Can we get the information on this? Yes. Ah, here. Uh, yes. Okay. And uh, do we have questions it's in the room? It's Laura speaking. Here? We have two, we two have questions. questions. Okay. Yeah. Do we have questions in the room here? Yeah. Okay. So then I hand back to, to Sandrake and we start with Then I hand back to, to Sandrake and we start with I have a question from the audience at this point. Oh, Brussels, sorry. Yes. Brussels? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have two questions from, from Brussels. So first from a gentleman from a Dutch uh, advisory uh, consulting company. So please, if you can uh, introduce yourself and uh, ask your question. Thank you, my name is... My name is Martin Timon from PwC Advisory in the Netherlands. Um, well, I have a question regarding uh, uh, compliance. Um, I heard uh, Mr. Nemitz as well as Mr. Gonsop say uh, that compliance is the goal and not enforcement. Um, and I would like to know to what extent will uh, data controls be asked to show accountability in the, themselves and how will this be made um, uh, beneficial? Uh, I think at this moment um, there are still fairly limited grounds for. Uh, for any competitive advantage, and I think also that um, um, and, and the enforcement, the impact of enforcement is still uh, quite low in um, um, uh, Europe uh, in general, and in the Netherlands uh, in specific. I think I, I read something about, uh, about that this morning in an interview with Mr. Consul. Uh, secondly, um, I think there's a high or prohibitive cost of certification on marks at this moment. Um, what you often see, see at this moment is that um, uh, companies still have a limited knowledge of the law, which is, uh, of course, uh, well, a lousy excuse and an even lousier defense in a court of law uh, or against uh, uh, a DPA. So basically my question is, um, um, should there be an incentive for data controllers to, uh, to show accountability themselves to prevent uh, uh, enforcement action uh, by a DPA? Thank you. And then we have a second question here, the gentleman here from, from Poland. All right, about Tatiana Cinkowski, Cardinal of the Sinski University from Warsaw, Poland. Actually, uh, I will say that it is all about compliance and not enforcement itself. Uh, Poland is a good example, I would say, because Polish DPA does not have authority to impose penalties or fines. So here, the new EU regulation will uh, improve his position. Therefore, this is what if question, namely what if the Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights enters into force? What if the EU regulation becomes law as it is drafted now? Whether uh, the European side will uh, find uh, the US regulations adequate enough 
or actually we are at the beginning of the story once again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. These were the two questions from Russell, so I now hand over to Washington again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there at this moment a question from the audience? Yes. Hello, hello. Hi everyone. Um, my name is Greg Polad. I work for FTI Consulting in Brussels. Um, my question to, I guess, more Mr. Nemitz than anybody else on the panel, is um, given that there are 26 delegated acts in the current text, which kind of throw us back to even after the vote on specific details of qualifiers for enforcement, how do you plan to get the US and the EU to work in parallel given those this very confusing schedule of specifications? And I, I have a very quick question also for the gentleman and the student. Hi. <laughs> I was just I'm just curious out of principle, um, is it is this a principal action you're leading? I don't work for Facebook now, but is this a, a leading is it a principal issue? Because I get the sense that you signed up for a service, you got some advantages out of it you weren't happy with the way it was conducted, so then you turned around it. I'm just trying to understand the motivation behind it. Just, just to understand. Thank you. Yes, please. Hello, uh, my name is Laura Ballard. I'm with the U.S. State Department, and I also had a question for Mr. Nemitz. I was uh, intrigued by your reference to antitrust or competition laws as a model for, for privacy law. Uh, I, I have a very limited understanding of, of that area of law, but my impression is that it um, tends to focus on, on uh, intentional misbehavior, often conspiracy between groups. And the fact that antitrust violations tend to be of that variety, I think, drives a lot of the thinking behind what sorts of fines would have a deterrent effect, uh, when to offer leniency for co-conspirators, and probably also drives the nature of enforcement actions, where in many cases, it's worthwhile to perform a dawn raid by the regulators because uh, there's a real danger that evidence is going to be destroyed. Whereas in privacy compliance, it, it seems like the, the problem may more often be um, negligence, carelessness, inadvertence, or, or simply failure to have a policy at all as opposed to having an intentionally bad policy. So I was wondering if you could elaborate on what ways you find that competition law is, is a good model for privacy law and if there were particular aspects. Um, that, that seem appropriate in the privacy enforcement context. Thank you. Is there any other question? Yes. Hi, it's Steve Delbianco with NetChoice. And, uh, you know, the, the metaphor of the multi-stakeholder model, and this is a question for our European colleagues. I've done the multi-stakeholder model for years, and I can tell you that it's less likely to produce steak and more likely to produce hamburger. You, you put people like Jeff Chester and I in a meat grinder, and after several years, those little bits all come out in something that's a palatable mess like hamburger. And that may well be what we'll get from it. And my question to my European colleagues is, if the, Euro if the U.S. multi-stakeholder process ends up settling on a code of conduct that says that opt-out is adequate for permission-based marketing, or that a company can read its cookies on other people's websites, will the European regulators consider that to be an adequate protection of consumers so that we can move towards this vision of harmony that everybody seems to want. Who wants to start with the... I'm glad, uh, I, wanna, uh, I wanna thank Max. I think what Max also exemplifies, and I guess we did ask the Gates Foundation to, to hire students and give them to the FTC and the European Commission, and we have a privacy problem taken care of. The important role of citizen activists and NGOs and independent stakeholder bodies, the important role that they play, and Costas was talking before about the consumer, but the, take, for example, the W3Cs do not track as an example of an important kind of independent force here. And to let the technologists with, with a broad range of stakeholders develop a system to prevent uh, a, a third party tracking. Well, that multi stakeholder process has already potentially been undermined by uh, an, the industry initiative, the Digital Advertising Alliance, which, uh, was, uh, which announced their plan at the White House that day. So I want to sort of underscore that we should, in fact, support 
these more independent approaches and encourage uh, the citizen activists to do their job. If I have one criticism about what I think both the EU and the US need to do more is responding to one of the, 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 the questions is this. I have found generally somebody who follows online advertising very closely, and I've done it since the 1990s. The Children's Online Privacy Protection Law was the, was the law that my wife and I created a campaign for, and Mark got it through Congress, but we've been tracking this industry for a very, very long time. The, the, the digital advertising contemporary practices are no secret, and they're not really new. And you know, if, if you could get the industry, and we're talking about the big guys, because the big guys have really set the tone, and going after the little actors don't, doesn't make much of a dent. But if you, but if knowing more about what they say to each other, and understanding what the intent is, and what the threats are, and how they're operationalizing the data collection practices through the business model they've articulated, I think would go a long way to addressing contemporary privacy problems and, and be able, and for the regulators to have, certainly in the United States, a much more informed uh, uh, discussion. Um, thanks. I'm questions for Yes, thank you very much. And uh, you know, maybe since I'm also trying to answer these five questions, maybe you think we've got a bit more than three minutes. First question: uh, uh, a net choice, so-called net choice. But well, very simple answer to your question: constitutional trade-offs have to be done by the legislature, by the rep elected representatives of the people. So a multi-stakeholder process does not carry the legitimacy of what the people decide. So that is the answer to your question. But of course, we listen to everything and we observe everywhere where there are interesting uh, debates. But in Europe, this is a constitutional right and therefore the decisions are taken by the legislator. Now, how are the DPAs are made accountable? Very simple answer, before courts. Because they are controlled by courts. Why is this not working so well? Why do we have so little judgments in Europe about the activities of the DPAs? Answer, because until now, the sanctions and the tools they had varied widely and were not very hard hitting. And if you're not hard hit, you don't go to a court. That will change certainly in the future, and then the courts will play a greater role in shaping this important area of law and also ensuring coherence across Europe. What does it take to make the big guys comply? Very good question. It takes political will and rigor in enforcement. Now, is this an issue which is specific to privacy? No. This is an issue which you find in many areas of law, you know, to make the big guys comply and also the small guys. Everybody has to comply because before the law, um, everybody has to be treated equally. Can we learn from other areas of law? Yes, and this brings me to the Department of State. Obviously, whether some com offense is committed intentionally or non-intentionally or maybe negligently or grossly negligently, that makes a big difference. And the 2% which we are proposing is an upper limit. Yes, so you know, it needs to be serious and probably it needs to be intentional. But from a structured point of view, there's no difference between the value we give to the market in our constitution on the one hand and the value we give to freedom and human dignity because that is what is underlying the protection of individual uh, uh, private data. And for this reason, the commission has proposed a percentage of the turnover and that is the methodology which comes from competition law. Just to inform you, the highest time in competition law is 10% of world turnover, and there we are very much in line uh, with the United States, which by the way puts people in prison uh, when there's a cartel, so they even uh, go further. So to answer the question also here for the student, we see the problem, and we have proposed measures, which we believe, as Jakob Kuhlschramm also said, will make this matter a matter of boardroom attention. And probably in some respects, this is exactly what our times call for. Now my last remark, I think it is a mistake only focus on the consumer perspective here. The big issue which is in everybody's mind is the cloud. Now, what's happening on the cloud in terms of rule making and in terms of enforcement? We in the European Union, our proposal will make it easier to use the cloud by, for example, standard protection clauses, BCLs, and so on. Have we done enough? 
On this, I don't know what you will be saying, but certainly we also need to think about enforcement issues which go beyond just consumer issues. We also have to protect personal data in B2B relationships when the cloud is used, and that's where um, the importance of international cooperation uh, comes in. We are very open for that, and of course we are very happy to listen to you here the audience, and maybe also Cameron and Terry, what you think um, and we could do together uh, to make the cloud also a credible uh, proposition. Because in the end, I think this is what we all agree on, it's about creating trust. And this is where, you know, the cloud is also the big issue. Uh, let me follow up with that and jump in here. And first, uh, let me begin. I want to, uh, uh, I want to thank Mr. Schrenz for, for his contributions. I think uh, what he has done is, uh, in part, an, an illustration of the importance of privacy policies. Uh, and, you know, many of us uh, uh, across uh, privacy policy making have been critical of privacy policies uh, uh, because so many people uh, do not read them because they are written uh, for lawyers. And, and that is the case. But they are also are important tools. Uh, for advocates like Mr. Uh, Schwinn, for NGOs uh, uh, you know, like Jeff Chester's that are an important part of uh, this process, for regulators, uh, for the press, uh, to help to hold people accountable. Uh, and the process of holding people accountable uh, is a dynamic and an evolving one. Uh, this is a dynamic and evolving area. You know, faster it evolves, uh, faster uh, than, than you know, even uh, uh, experts uh, in the field uh, can keep up with. Uh, it evolves faster than legislators, regulators, and policy makers uh, uh, are able to keep up with. But you know, the, the, those tools of accountability uh, are important. Um, uh, PR is important. And Jakob, having heard the question, uh, from the gentleman from the Netherlands, you may, you may need to do something to uh, step up uh, the uh, your PR. But uh, you know, we did hear from some of the questions and some of the statements. Uh, the, the, the Dutch uh, gentleman saw an article that was published this morning stating that I have said that our budgets should absolutely be raised because half of the cases where I really would want to go in enforcement. I simply don't have the staff to do so, and that's what he well, uh, probably tried to say, but he had not enough time to explain. <laughs> <laughs> I agree that the, the FTC is under-resourced uh, as well. But I think you know, the challenge for, uh, for policymakers in this dynamic uh, area uh, is, uh, is to keep up. Uh, I think we, we tend to view the internet is something hard to view the cloud as something different. But um, a lot of the same rules that have evolved uh, uh, in the physical world uh, apply in the cloud, apply uh, in, uh, in the virtual world of the internet. Uh, the challenge is uh, figuring out those analogies, figuring out what uh, uh, accepted principles of jurisdiction, choice of law, Forum uh, and others uh, uh, should apply in these areas, but you know that uh, that is continuing work uh, uh, of enforcement agencies and policymakers uh, as these conversations continue. Thank you, Secretary. Is that constant? Yes, just two points of the questions that were raised. One of uh, the questions of Max being big shots. How, how are we going to? get them to comply. I really think that uh, as far as the uh, draft regulation is concerned, there's two big important steps as far as the European side is concerned. The first, I was told already, the fines is very, very important. We, some of our colleagues don't have fine possibilities. So then how do you get there if you want to enforce it? Secondly, um, we need to work together and have in, indeed whatever that will 
mean in the end, the one stop shop, that means a lead DPA who together, in coordination with the other DPAs, goes for it. Because nowadays, sometimes, and as the president of the working party, I sometimes really would want to already have this new <laughs> regulation in place and say, hey, let's work together. Let's appoint one DPA who takes the case up and goes for it. We did it um, uh, just a couple of weeks ago with the new Google uh, change of privacy uh, policy. We asked the French DPA, the CNIL, to take it up for all of us in coordination with that. But it's the CNIL who takes it up. And then you can, you, you, there is a possibility of having a fist. Now, the second point that I wanted to answer uh, I, I, uh, about the multi-stakeholder uh, uh, concepts, whether they will end up in a hamburger. The, the, <laughs> that was about the question, I guess, that the, whether if the multi-stakeholder concept would end up with opt-out, uh, would that be adequate? Um, if, it, if, it's, if it's online behavioral advertising with, I, I'd call them third-party cookies, an opt-out um, uh, outcome wouldn't be adequate as far as the European side is concerned. Um, and there, of course, becomes the, becomes the problem between the consumer's situation and the fundamental right situation in the European Union, where in this case we have decided, and we, with the new draft regulation in hand, are even more stronger in the opinion that for using or placing using the information generated by individuals, uh, you need you need consent, consent, explicit consent, and you can't uh, leave it with a, with an opt out. And then I come it comes in the word interoperability. I won't say that I'm against it. But I would want to know what it exactly means. And I haven't heard any definition that is really fitting into my brains to see whether if this is a situation, for example, the one says opt in, the other says opt out, how is then interoperability going to work? Or are we leaving the big companies with their transporter um, uh, effects doing what they want to do? Is that the definition of interoperability? Uh, I would just like to raise, I fully agree with uh, what the previous speaker said about how to make the big companies comply with, uh, with the law. You need sanctions, you need uh, deterrence of you. They need to know that if they do not comply with the law, they will be punished for that. Unfortunately, if you don't comply with the rules, you need to bear the uh, responsibility and the sanctions. About the competition, I fully agree. Like, we always say that a high level of protection of personal data and privacy should be a competitive advantage for a company. It should be like this theory. In practice, it's the other way around. We see that the most popular companies, or like services, are the ones who rate, do not comply with the rules. And I think this is the role of the regulators to bring them down uh, to the same level, and everybody has to comply with the same rules. Every European or American company, uh, whenever personal data of Europeans are concerned, they have to comply with the same rules. And therefore, competition, I think, of competition, it's very interesting because even, I'm not a competition law expert, but as far as I know, where there is a negotiation about the fines and the sanction, uh, the competition authorities take into account the measures and um, that have been established by the company. And this is the system that the, the draft proposal of the European Commission uh, uh, proposes. Uh, the sanctions go up to 2%, but then, of course, there is flexibility taken into account. And we always use the example of competition law, uh, because when it comes to the damages for consumers, it's the same with the competition and data protection. In both cases, the damages are uh, immaterial. It's very hard to quantify and to put a price on it. But we see that in competition, uh, in some countries, consumers can actually claim compensation as well when there is a competition increase. It should be the same with data protection. And then the last point, because the comment about um, uh, address to Max, I don't want to reply for you, but there was a comment whether it's an action on Facebook and consumers actually benefit from using the service. And uh, this is a very simplistic approach that uh, consumers use the service and expect these companies, the service providers, to comply with the rules. It's not possible to say that it's your choice, even if I do not comply with the rules. 
you have the choice. In most cases, consumers do not have the choice. Uh, once they uh, start using the services, if, uh, if the service provider changes the privacy policies, you don't have a choice. It's either you continue or you, or you, it's either, either all or nothing. This is not a real choice. Thank you, Professor. Max, do you want to answer the question of why did you start these complaints after using a service that was free for you? Um, um, first of all, Facebook is not free. The only reason why we get on the website is because there's interesting content and that was delivered by the user. It's not by Facebook. They just put a shell there. Um, so I don't believe that Facebook is a free service at all. Um, and the second thing is, uh, I did it because I wanted to be able to trust that service. I do like Facebook. I still use it every day. And it's a cool service that especially my generation loves it in, in the European Union. But if you read daily news, people worry. They have like 10 or 20 emails a day of people that said, as soon as I read what you're doing, I locked off the site. I'm not using it anymore. And that's exactly what we need is that we have trust in these services, something we had other times already today. That's the only motivation. No money involved, especially. Thank you, Max. Uh, I want to make one more point um, about the, that is subject's right to obtain his information is the importance of making um, of uh, trying to get the information about the logic of processing behind um, the data in the profile. Um, could you tell us in one minute, no more, uh, what kind of information you got that um, that you okay. that there um, was um, kind of difficulty in trying to get that specific information, information that helps the social network users um, um, build a profile on you. Um, we didn't get any of this information right now. I got 57 data categories. Facebook is right now handing out to other people 22 data categories. Right now we know that they do have 85 data categories. The Irish Data Protection Commission says we get access to 33, not saying well, we don't get access to the others. And for all the logic involved, we didn't even get to the point so far, because that is a little more than just basic. One of my favorite quotes on Facebook was, I do not get my facial recognition data, because according to them, it's their trade secret what happens. <laughs> That's a good argument you get, by the way. Yes, uh, So I, I just wanted to make three points. Um, first of all, I think it's interesting that we often focus on the differences between the EU, EU and US frameworks. And I, I do want to emphasize that there's a lot of commonality, at least as to high level principles. And um, you know, things like I completely agree with the statements that were made about compliance being the goal here and not enforcement in and of itself. Accountability, transparency, choice. These are all things that we agree on on both sides of the Atlantic. And I think, you know, I think part of the way we build bridges is, you know, we've had discussions with the individual DPAs. We face the same challenges, under-resourced. Um, how do you deter? How do you publicize? Um, Jakob and I were talking last week about um, getting technologists on staff. How do we get people on staff who understand the technology and who can deal with new issues as they come up? Um, a second point I wanted to make is I just wanted to address Jeff's criticism about uh, the current FTC and, and how the FTC might look in the future. Um, I think it's important to, uh, to not lose sight of the fact that we're not just the agency that sued Google and Facebook. Uh, we do a lot of other things. We have done a lot of things for many years. I mentioned 35 data security cases. Um, uh, the uh, Choice Point case was a very highly publicized case in which we got $15 million in civil penalties. Uh, we advocated the Do Not Call Registry, uh, which is a very well-known and important privacy initiative in the United States. Um, and I anticipate that the FTC will continue, um, no matter what the administration, um, to show leadership in this area. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to address uh, the question that came up about cloud. Um, I think it's interesting that the statute we enforce, the FTC Act, Prohibition Against Unfair and Deceptive Practices, uh, it's very general, it's very broad, it was enacted in 1935. And I don't think anybody anticipated the ways that we would be using it now on uh, mobile devices and ad networks and even the internet. Um, and I think cloud is, is no different. So we brought cases involving the cloud, uh, the Twitter case, the Google Click case, uh, requiring those companies to, um, uh, to maintain privacy of information in the cloud. Um, and we've also said that even if it's a B2B service, if I'm giving my information to a company and that company later stores it in the cloud, the consumer-facing company is still on the hook to, pr pr uh, to protect my data. And so uh, whatever happens to the data in the cloud, the consumer-facing company is still responsible. So these are just some of the ways we've tried to deal with the cloud issues. Um, and, um, uh, um, and I hope that we will continue to um, address new technologies in this way in the future. Uh, if 
I could just jump in quickly in defense of the, the FTC, which has been a terrific uh, uh, advisor and collaborator in the work that we've done. Uh, a lot of the work that Manisha described is work that was uh, carried on or uh, begun before uh, uh, President Obama appointed a majority of Democratic commissioners in that, that commission. Uh, and, uh, you know, there the, uh, a lot of the work is done by career employees, uh, um, and the FTC uh, work in past years is a real tribute to the independent uh, commissions uh, that exist uh, in this country, uh, where you have to, uh, under the Bush administration, two Democratic uh, commissioners and one Republican commissioner uh, voting to do a lot of the work that's, that's been described in this area. Thank you. Um, no, just get first look at your. Oh, yeah, please check if they have any, uh, any questions. If there is anyone from Facebook who would like to answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We are in the room, but we don't need to answer. We're here. <laughs> we're good. We're happy. We're fine. We're listening. We're listening. There had been a question uh, before from Brussels. Um, there had been a question before from Brussels about um, if there had been a question. This is Monty Barthwaite from the State Department. Um, there had been a question before from Brussels that I wanted to kind of hear the answer to. Essentially, the gentleman was asking um, if uh, the Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights was enacted. So there's a bill now uh, in the Congress. Uh, would that essentially, particularly from the folks from Europe, would that essentially be good enough for adequacy? What would, then perhaps you can elaborate, what would that kind of a signal look like? Um, I felt like that didn't, ha didn't go answer it, so I kind of wanted to raise the question. Yes, at first, Peter Hastings' question, I think one needs both. One needs immediate action. The DPA must be able to tell the company, you now stop doing this and this. Maybe even you should be doing this and this. But I think you also need fines. Because in the end, you know, money is being made by collecting, treating, and dealing in data. And uh, so you know, there must be a risk of non-compliance which goes beyond just an order of remedial action. I think, um, like in every enforcement situation, likely to be caught, times the size of the fine determines a general preventive impact. And in particular, if the authorities are under-resourced, 
you know, likely to be caught very low, therefore better get the fines a little up, and then the system will be in balance. And that's no news specific to privacy that you find in many other areas of law too. Civil action and DPAs, yes, maybe in the United States, again, like in other areas of law, civil action with travel damages, punitive damages and so on, is a much more interesting way. In Europe, we don't have a tradition like that. It's not specific to privacy. Uh, maybe for that reason, there's more of an emphasis on public enforcement uh, in Europe on some things. Uh, so I think these are natural differences uh, between and historic differences between the legal systems. And honestly, we will not change them in privacy. In the United States, travel damages and all your collective action, class actions will always be you know, a very important impact on the balance of public policy interest. Uh, in Europe, we don't have it, so we have to compensate with, with other means. But this should not stand in the way of working together where, where we can do this. Question from the State Department on adequacy. Um, I would say the following. Now that you are starting to develop these codes of conduct, we have heard it's going to be a very open process. Why not try, through the codes of conduct, to encapsulate the substance of the safe harbor. Because if the codes of conduct would encapsulate the substance of the safe harbor so that every company which complies with the code of conduct could automatically say, and we also therefore comply with the safe harbor, a great step towards interoperability would be done. And I think, honestly, that is now in your hands to think about whether that is an option for you and one could start it from a sectoral basis. One could say, okay, we start with a code of conduct on this or that sector, but we're aiming to catch two flies here at the same time. A, to fulfill the promises of President Obama domestically, but B, to ensure that every company who falls under the code of conduct at the same time complies with the safe harbor rules. That would be a great step forward on interoperability, and I invite you you know, to talk with us and maybe also your stakeholders to see what that's doable. We're interested in having that to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, just concluding words, I would say that in both the EU and the US, effectiveness depends, we've heard it a lot, on budget staffing. It also depends on cooperation between the US and the EU, where enforcement, um, uh, to get um, effective enforcement, despite the, the, the various diverse conception on privacy. Also, to mention the importance of informing people about their rights, so that it makes and make it easier to enforce their access right, which will have inevitably an impact on uh, increasing compliance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to the entire panel. We now break again for the working coffee.